Chapter Ten of The Empty House and Other Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. The Empty House and Other Ghost Stories by Algernon Blackwood. The Strange Adventures of a Private Secretary in New York. Part One it was never quite clear to me how jim shorthouse managed to get his private secretaryship but once he got it he kept it and for some years he led a steady life and put money in the savings bank one morning his employer sent for him into the study and it was evident to the secretary's trained senses that there was something unusual in the air mr shorthouse he began somewhat nervously i have never yet had the opportunity of observing whether or not you are possessed of personal courage shorthouse gasped but he said nothing he was growing accustomed to the eccentricities of his chief shorthouse was a kentish man sidebotham was raised in chicago new york was the present place of residence but the other continued with a puff at his very black cigar i must consider myself a poor judge of human nature in future if it is not one of your strongest qualities the private secretary made a foolish little bow in modest appreciation of so uncertain a compliment mr jonas b sidebottom watched him narrowly as the novelists say before he continued his remarks i have no doubt that you are a plucky fellow and he hesitated and puffed at his cigar as if his life depended upon keeping it alight i don't think i'm afraid of anything in particular sir except women interposed the young man feeling that it was time for him to make an observation of some sort but still quite in the dark as to his chief's purpose humph he grunted well there are no women in this case so far as i know but there may be other things that that hurt more wants a special service of some kind evidently was the secretary's reflection personal violence he asked aloud possibly puff in fact puff puff probably shorthouse smelt an increase of salary in the air it had a stimulating effect i've had some experience of that article sir he said shortly but i'm ready to undertake anything in reason i can't say how much reason or unreason there may prove to be in this particular case it all depends mr sidebottom got up and locked the door of his study and drew down the blinds of both windows then he took a bunch of keys from his pocket and opened a black tin box he ferreted about among blue and white papers for a few seconds enveloping himself as he did so in a cloud of blue tobacco smoke i feel like a detective already shorthouse laughed speak low please returned the other glancing round the room we must observe the utmost secrecy perhaps you would be kind enough to close the registers he went on in a still lower voice open registers have betrayed conversations before now shorthouse began to enter into the spirit of the thing he tiptoed across the floor and shut the two iron gratings in the wall that in american houses supply hot air and are termed registers mr sidebottom had meanwhile found the paper he was looking for he held it in front of him and tapped it once or twice with the back of his right hand as if it were a stage letter and himself the villain of the melodrama this is a letter from joel garvey my old partner he said at length you have heard me speak of him 
the other bowed he knew that many years before garvey and sidebottom had been well known in the chicago financial world he knew that the amazing rapidity with which they accumulated a fortune had only been surpassed by the amazing rapidity with which they had immediately afterwards disappeared into space he was further aware his position afforded facilities that each partner was still to some extent in the other's power and that each wished most devoutly that the other would die the sins of his employer's early years did not concern him however the man was kind and just if eccentric and shorthouse being in new york did not probe to discover more particularly the sources whence his salary was so regularly paid moreover the two men had grown to like each other and there was a genuine feeling of trust and respect between them i hope it's a pleasant communication sir he said in a low voice quite the reverse returned the other fingering the paper nervously as he stood in front of the fire blackmail i suppose precisely mr sidebottom's cigar was not burning well he struck a match and applied it to the uneven edge and presently his voice spoke through clouds of wreathing smoke there are valuable papers in my possession bearing his signature i cannot inform you of their nature but they are extremely valuable to me they belong as a matter of fact to garvey as much as to me only i've got them i see garvey writes that he wants to have his signature removed wants to cut it out with his own hand he gives reasons which incline me to consider his request and would you like me to take him the papers and see that he does it and bring them back again with you he whispered screwing up his eyes into a shrewd grimace and bring them back again with me repeated the secretary i understand perfectly shorthouse knew from unfortunate experience more than a little of the horrors of blackmail the pressure garvey was bringing to bear upon his old enemy must be exceedingly strong that was quite clear at the same time the commission that was being entrusted to him seemed somewhat chaotic in its nature he had already enjoyed more than one experience of his employer's eccentricity and he now caught himself wondering whether this same eccentricity did not sometimes go further than eccentricity i cannot read the letter to you mr sidebottom was explaining but i shall give it into your hands it will prove that you are my er my accredited representative i shall also ask you not to read the package of papers the signature in question you will find of course on the last page at the bottom there was a pause of several minutes during which the end of the cigar glowed eloquently circumstances compel me he went on at length almost in a whisper or i should never do this but you understand of course the thing is a ruse cutting out the signature is a mere pretense it is nothing what garvey wants are the papers themselves the confidence reposed in the private secretary was not misplaced shorthouse was as faithful to mr sidebottom as a man ought to be to the wife that loves him the commission itself seemed very simple garvey lived in solitude in the remote part of long island shorthouse was to take the papers to him witness the cutting out of the signature and to be specially on his guard against any attempt forcible or otherwise to gain possession of them it seemed to him a somewhat ludicrous adventure but he did not know all the facts and perhaps was not the best judge 
the two men talked in low voices for another hour at the end of which mr sidebottom drew up the blinds opened the registers and unlocked the door shorthouse rose to go his pockets were stuffed with papers and his head with instructions but when he reached the door he hesitated and turned well said his chief shorthouse looked him straight in the eye and said nothing the personal violence i suppose said the other shorthouse bowed i have not seen garvey for twenty years he said all i can tell you is that i believe him to be occasionally of unsound mind i have heard strange rumours he lives alone and in his lucid intervals studies chemistry it was always a hobby of his but the chances are twenty to one against his attempting violence i only wish to warn you in case i mean so that you may be on the watch he handed his secretary a smith and wesson revolver as he spoke shorthouse slipped it into his hip pocket and went out of the room a drizzling cold rain was falling on fields covered with half-melted snow when shorthouse stood late in the afternoon on the platform of the lonely little long island station and watched the train he had just left vanish into the distance it was a bleak country that joel garvey esq formerly of chicago had chosen for his residence and on this particular afternoon it presented a more than usually dismal appearance an expanse of flat fields covered with dirty snow stretched away on all sides till the sky dropped down to meet them only occasional farm buildings broke the monotony and the road wound along muddy lanes and beneath dripping trees swathed in the cold raw fog that swept in like a pall of the dead from the sea it was six miles from the station to garvey's house and the driver of the rickety buggy shorthouse had found at the station was not communicative between the dreary landscape and the drearier driver he fell back upon his own thoughts which but for the spice of adventure that was promised would themselves have been even drearier than either he made up his mind that he would waste no time over the transaction the moment the signature was cut out he would pack up and be off the last train back to brooklyn was seven fifteen and he would have to walk the six miles of mud and snow for the driver of the buggy had refused point blank to wait for him for purposes of safety shorthouse had done what he flattered himself was rather a clever thing he had made up a second packet of papers identical in outside appearance with the first the inscription the blue envelope the red elastic band and even a blot in the lower left-hand corner had been exactly reproduced inside of course were only sheets of blank paper it was his intention to change the packets and to let garvey see him put the sham one into the bag in case of violence the bag would be the point of attack and he intended to lock it and throw away the key before it could be forced open and the deception discovered there would be time to increase his chances of escape with the real packet it was five o'clock when the silent yehu pulled up in front of a half-broken gate and pointed with his whip to a house that stood in its grounds among trees and was just visible in the gathering gloom shorthouse told him to drive up to the front door but the man refused i ain't runnin no risks he said i've got a family this cryptic remark was not encouraging but shorthouse did not pause to decipher it he paid the man and then pushed open the rickety old gate swinging on a single hinge and proceeded to walk up the drive that lay dark between close standing trees the house soon came into full view it was tall and square and had once evidently been white but now the walls were covered with dirty patches and there were wide yellow streaks where the plaster had fallen away the windows stared black and uncompromising into the night the garden was overgrown with weeds and long grass standing up in ugly patches beneath their burden of wet snow 
complete silence reigned over all there was not a sign of life not even a dog barked only in the distance the wheels of the retreating carriage could be heard growing fainter and fainter as he stood in the porch between pillars of rotting wood listening to the rain dripping from the roof into the puddles of slushy snow he was conscious of a sensation of utter desertion and loneliness such as he had never before experienced the forbidding aspect of the house had the immediate effect of lowering his spirits it might well have been the abode of monsters or demons in a child's wonder tale creatures that only dared to come out under cover of darkness he groped for the bell handle or knocker and finding neither he raised his stick and beat a loud tattoo on the door the sound echoed away in an empty space on the other side and the wind moaned past him between the pillars as if startled at his audacity but there was no sound of approaching footsteps and no one came to open the door again he beat a tattoo louder and longer than the first one and having done so waited with his back to the house and stared across the unkempt garden into the fast-gathering shadows then he turned suddenly and saw that the door was standing ajar it had been quietly opened and a pair of eyes were peering at him round the edge there was no light in the hall beyond and he could only just make out the shape of a dim human face does mr garvey live here he asked in a firm voice who are you came in a man's tones i'm mr sidebotham's private secretary i wish to see mr garvey on important business are you expected i suppose so he said impatiently thrusting a card through the opening please take my name to him at once and say i come from mr sidebotham on the matter mr garvey wrote about the man took the card and the face vanished into the darkness leaving shorthouse standing in the cold porch with mingled feelings of impatience and dismay the door he now noticed for the first time was on a chain and could not open more than a few inches but it was the manner of his reception that caused uneasy reflections to stir within him reflections that continued for some minutes before they were interrupted by the sound of approaching footsteps and the flicker of a light in the hall the next instant the chain fell with a rattle and gripping his bag tightly he walked into a large ill-smelling hall of which he could only just see the ceiling there was no light but the nickering taper held by the man and by its uncertain glimmer shorthouse turned to examine him he saw an undersized man of middle age with brilliant shifting eyes a curling black beard and a nose that at once proclaimed him a jew his shoulders were bent and as he watched him replacing the chain he saw that he wore a peculiar black gown like a priest's cassock reaching to the feet it was altogether a lugubrious figure of a man sinister and funereal yet it seemed in perfect harmony with the general character of its surroundings the hall was devoid of furniture of any kind and against the dingy walls stood rows of old picture frames empty and disordered and odd-looking bits of woodwork that appeared doubly fantastic as their shadows danced queerly over the floor in the shifting light if you'll come this way mr garvey will see you presently said the jew gruffly crossing the floor and shielding the taper with a bony hand he never once raised his eyes above the level of the visitor's waistcoat and to shorthouse he somehow suggested a figure from the dead rather than a man of flesh and blood the hall smelt decidedly ill all the more surprising then was the scene that met his eyes when the jew opened the door at the further end and he entered a room brilliantly lit with swinging lamps and furnished with a degree of taste and comfort that amounted to luxury 
the walls were lined with handsomely bound books and armchairs were arranged round a large mahogany desk in the middle of the room a bright fire burned in the grate and neatly framed photographs of men and women stood on the mantelpiece on either side of an elaborately carved clock french windows that opened like doors were partially concealed by warm red curtains and on a sideboard against the wall stood decanters and glasses with several boxes of cigars piled on top of one another there was a pleasant odour of tobacco about the room indeed it was in such glowing contrast to the chilly poverty of the hall that shorthouse already was conscious of a distinct rise in the thermometer of his spirits then he turned and saw the jew standing in the doorway with his eyes fixed upon him somewhere about the middle button of his waistcoat he presented a strangely repulsive appearance that somehow could not be attributed to any particular detail and the secretary associated him in his mind with a monstrous black bird of prey more than anything else my time is short he said abruptly i hope mr garvey will not keep me waiting a strange flicker of a smile appeared on the jew's ugly face and vanished as quickly as it came he made a sort of deprecating bow by way of reply then he blew out the taper and went out closing the door noiselessly behind him shorthouse was alone he felt relieved there was an air of obsequious insolence about the old jew that was very offensive he began to take note of his surroundings he was evidently in the library of the house for the walls were covered with books almost up to the ceiling there was no room for pictures nothing but the shining backs of well-bound volumes looked down upon him four brilliant lights hung from the ceiling and a reading lamp with a polished reflector stood among the disordered masses of papers on the desk the lamp was not lit but when shorthouse put his hand upon it he found it was warm the room had evidently only just been vacated apart from the testimony of the lamp however he had already felt without being able to give a reason for it that the room had been occupied a few moments before he entered the atmosphere over the desk seemed to retain the disturbing influence of a human being an influence moreover so recent that he felt as if the cause of it were still in his immediate neighbourhood it was difficult to realize that he was quite alone in the room and that somebody was not in hiding the finer counterparts of his senses warned him to act as if he were being observed he was dimly conscious of a desire to fidget and look round to keep his eyes in every part of the room at once and to conduct himself generally as if he were the object of careful human observation how far he recognized the cause of these sensations it is impossible to say but they were sufficiently marked to prevent his carrying out a strong inclination to get up and make a search of the room he sat quite still staring alternately at the backs of the books and at the red curtains wondering all the time if he was really being watched or if it was only the imagination playing tricks with him a full quarter of an hour passed and then twenty rows of volumes suddenly shifted out toward him and he saw that a door had opened in the wall opposite the books were only sham backs after all and when they moved back again with the sliding door shorthouse saw the figure of joel garvey standing before him surprise almost took his breath away he had expected to see an unpleasant even a vicious apparition with the mark of the beast unmistakably upon its face but he was wholly unprepared for the elderly tall fine-looking man who stood in front of him well groomed refined vigorous with a lofty forehead clear grey eyes and a hooked nose dominating a clean-shaven mouth and a chin of considerable character a distinguished-looking man altogether 
i'm afraid i've kept you waiting mr shorthouse he said in a pleasant voice but with no trace of a smile in the mouth or eyes but the fact is you know i've a mania for chemistry and just when you were announced i was at the most critical moment of a problem and was really compelled to bring it to a conclusion shorthouse had risen to meet him but the other motioned him to resume his seat it was borne in upon him irresistibly that mr joel garvey for reasons best known to himself was deliberately lying and he could not help wondering at the necessity for such an elaborate misrepresentation he took off his overcoat and sat down i've no doubt too that the door startled you garvey went on evidently reading something of his guest's feelings in his face you probably had not suspected it it leads into my little laboratory chemistry is an absorbing study to me and i spend most of my time there mr garvey moved up to the armchair on the opposite side of the fireplace and sat down shorthouse made appropriate answers to these remarks but his mind was really engaged in taking stock of mr sidebottom's old-time partner so far there was no sign of mental irregularity and there was certainly nothing about him to suggest violent wrongdoing or coarseness of living on the whole mr sidebottom's secretary was most pleasantly surprised and wishing to conclude his business as speedily as possible he made a motion towards the bag for the purpose of opening it when his companion interrupted him quickly you are mr sidebottom's private secretary are you not he asked shorthouse replied that he was mr sidebottom he went on to explain has entrusted me with the papers in the case and i have the honour to return to you your letter of a week ago he handed the letter to garvey who took it without a word and deliberately placed it in the fire he was not aware that the secretary was ignorant of its contents yet his face betrayed no signs of feeling shorthouse noticed however that his eyes never left the fire until the last morsel had been consumed then he looked up and said you are familiar then with the facts of this most peculiar case shorthouse saw no reason to confess his ignorance i have all the papers mr garvey he replied taking them out of the bag and i should be very glad if we could transact our business as speedily as possible if you will cut your signature i one moment please interrupted the other i must before we proceed further consult some papers in my laboratory if you will allow me to leave you alone a few minutes for this purpose we can conclude the whole matter in a very short time shorthouse did not approve of this further delay but he had no option than to acquiesce and when garvey had left the room by the private door he sat and waited with the papers in his hand the minutes went by and the other did not return to pass the time he thought of taking the false packet from his coat to see that the papers were in order and the move was indeed almost completed when something he never knew what warned him to desist the feeling again came over him that he was being watched and he leaned back in his chair with the bag on his knees and waited with considerable impatience for the other's return for more than twenty minutes he waited and when at length the door opened and garvey appeared with profuse apologies for the delay he saw by the clock that only a few minutes still remained of the time he had allowed himself to catch the last train now i am completely at your service he said pleasantly you must of course know mr shorthouse that one cannot be too careful in matters of this kind especially he went on speaking very slowly and impressively in dealing with a man like my former partner whose mind as you doubtless may have discovered is at times very sadly affected shorthouse made no reply to this he felt that the other was watching him as a cat watches a mouse 
it is almost a wonder to me garvey added that he is still at large unless he has greatly improved it can hardly be safe for those who are closely associated with him the other began to feel uncomfortable either this was the other side of the story or it was the first signs of mental irresponsibility all business matters of importance require the utmost care in my opinion mr garvey he said at length cautiously ah then as i thought you have had a great deal to put up with from him garvey said with his eyes fixed on his companion's face and no doubt he is still as bitter against me as he was years ago when the disease first showed itself although this last remark was a deliberate question and the questioner was waiting with fixed eyes for an answer shorthouse elected to take no notice of it without a word he pulled the elastic band from the blue envelope with a snap and plainly showed his desire to conclude the business as soon as possible the tendency on the other's part to delay did not suit him at all but never personal violence i trust mr shorthouse he added never i'm glad to hear it garvey said in a sympathetic voice very glad to hear it and now he went on if you are ready we can transact this little matter of business before dinner it will only take a moment he drew a chair up to the desk and sat down taking a pair of scissors from a drawer his companion approached with the papers in his hand unfolding them as he came garvey at once took them from him and after turning over a few pages he stopped and cut out a piece of writing at the bottom of the last sheet but one holding it up to him shorthouse read the words joel garvey in faded ink there that's my signature he said and i've cut it out it must be nearly twenty years since i wrote it and now i'm going to burn it he went to the fire and stooped over to burn the little slip of paper and while he watched it being consumed shorthouse put the real papers in his pocket and slipped the imitation ones into the bag garvey turned just in time to see this latter movement i'm putting the papers back shorthouse said quietly you've done with them i think certainly he replied as completely deceived he saw the blue envelope disappear into the black bag and watched shorthouse turn the key they no longer have the slightest interest for me as he spoke he moved over to the sideboard and pouring himself out a small glass of whisky asked his visitor if he might do the same for him but the visitor declined and was already putting on his overcoat when garvey turned with genuine surprise on his face you surely are not going back to new york to-night mr shorthouse he said in a voice of astonishment i've just time to catch the seven fifteen if i'm quick but i never heard of such a thing garvey said of course i took it for granted that you would stay the night it's kind of you said shorthouse but really i must return to-night i never expected to stay the two men stood facing each other garvey pulled out his watch i'm exceedingly sorry he said but upon my word i took it for granted you would stay i ought to have said so long ago i'm such a lonely fellow and so little accustomed to visitors that i fear i forgot my manners altogether but in any case mr shorthouse you cannot catch the seven fifteen for it's already after six o'clock and that's the last train to-night garvey spoke very quickly almost eagerly but his voice sounded genuine there's time if i walk quickly said the young man with decision moving towards the door he glanced at his watch as he went hitherto he had gone by the clock on the mantelpiece to his dismay he saw that it was as his host had said long after six 
the clock was half an hour slow and he realized at once that it was no longer possible to catch the train had the hands of the clock been moved back intentionally had he been purposely detained unpleasant thoughts flashed into his brain and made him hesitate before taking the next step his employer's warning rang in his ears the alternative was six miles along a lonely road in the dark or a night under garvey's roof the former seemed a direct invitation to catastrophe if catastrophe there was planned to be the latter well the choice was certainly small one thing however he realized was plain he must show neither fear nor hesitancy my watch must have gained he observed quietly turning the hands back without looking up it seems i have certainly missed that train and shall be obliged to throw myself upon your hospitality but believe me i had no intention of putting you out to any such extent i'm delighted the other said defer to the judgment of an older man and make yourself comfortable for the night there's a bitter storm outside and you don't put me out at all on the contrary it's a great pleasure i have so little contact with the outside world that it's really a godsend to have you the man's face changed as he spoke his manner was cordial and sincere shorthouse began to feel ashamed of his doubts and to read between the lines of his employer's warning he took off his coat and the two men moved to the armchairs beside the fire you see garvey went on in a lowered voice i understand your hesitancy perfectly i didn't know sidebottom all those years without knowing a good deal about him perhaps more than you do i've no doubt now he filled your mind with all sorts of nonsense about me probably told you that i was the greatest villain unhung eh and all that sort of thing poor fellow he was a fine sort before his mind became unhinged one of his fancies used to be that everybody else was insane or just about to become insane is he still as bad as that few men replied shorthouse with the manner of making a great confidence but entirely refusing to be drawn go through his experiences and reach his age without entertaining delusions of one kind or another perfectly true said garvey your observation is evidently keen very keen indeed shorthouse replied taking his cue neatly but of course there are some things and here he looked cautiously over his shoulder there are some things one cannot talk about too circumspectly i understand perfectly and respect your reserve there was a little more conversation and then garvey got up and excused himself on the plea of superintending the preparation of the bedroom it's quite an event to have a visitor in the house and i want to make you as comfortable as possible he said marks will do better for a little supervision and he added with a laugh as he stood in the doorway i want you to carry back a good account to sidebottom End of chapter 10